All right, let's talk about increasing functions. So this exercise is interesting because all we know about this function f is that it's increasing and that it goes from a closed interval to the real numbers. But it turns out that's enough to prove that its set of discontinuities has measure zero. Um, and this uses sort of an interesting argument where we look at the set of points. Here, let me, let me start writing it out. So, exercise 1-30 says that for such a function f which is increasing like this, if we have x1 through xn, a finite collection of distinct points, and of course these are distinct points in this closed interval, then the sum from i equals 1 to n of the oscillation of f at xi is going to be strictly less than fb minus f of a. Now this is an exercise that we already proved and you can go back and look at that video and in proving this exercise we defined f of x plus to be the limit as y decreases to x of f of y. So the li this is the limit as y approaches x from the right. We also define f of x minus to be the same thing but from the left. It's the limit as y increases to x of f of y. And also in, in the proof of that exercise, we showed that the oscillation of f at x is precisely the limit from the right minus the limit from the left. And so what we're saying is that um, so once we start to use this, what happens is, and this is something that's not really useful for this exercise, but, well, I'll, I'll mention this at the end, but this is, this exercise, the proof, the idea is similar to the, to the idea that you use to prove that an uncountable sum of strictly positive numbers is infinite. But anyways, so we're going to, um, Return to this. So let's define a n to be the set of all points x such that the oscillation of f at x, of course this is points x which are in the closed interval from a to b. So, so uh, the set of points x such that the oscillation of f at x is greater than 1 over n. Now let b be any finite subset of a n. If we we can use exercise 1-30 to prove that f of b minus f of a is greater than well now we've got a finite if we take the sum over all, why does that keep happening? If we take the sum over all x and b of the oscillation of f at x, then what we're doing is we're taking a finite number of points in the interval from a to b and evaluating this oscillation of f and x, and so that inequality from exercise 1-30 applies. But now if we look at this, the oscillation of f at x is always going to be greater than 1 over n, just because all the x's are in b, which is a subset of a n. And so then this is, ugh, I hate that. So this is going to be greater than the sum over all x and b of 1 over n. So we're taking 1 over n and we're summing it up once for every element in b. So this is precisely the number, I, I'm writing this as the norm of b, but this means because b is a set, this operation we, inter we naturally interpret that, that to mean the number of elements in b. 
So the number of elements in B times 1 over N. And so we can solve this for the size of B. And we get that B is less than N times F of B minus F of A. Okay, so we have an upper bound on the number of elements in B. So for this to hold for every finite subset of a n, it must be the case that a that the size of a n also satisfies the same equality f of b minus f of a because if it weren't the case that this hold, then in particular you could just consider the set, well, suppose, so what we're really worried about here is the possibility of an being infinite. But if we suppose that an were infinite, then you could have a finite subset with more, with um, enough elements that you have more elements that, than this bound. And so this inequality that we proved wouldn't hold. And so it can't be the case that an is infinite. And if an is finite but it has more elements than here, then the subset b we could take is could be precisely an. So it must be the case that an itself must have this bound on the number of elements it contains. And this is a finite number. And so this is finite. And so each an has only finitely many elements. So what that means is that if we look at the union of all the ANs, it's a countable union of finite sets, and so it is countable. I'm pretty sure I talked about that in a previous exercise, how you can list elements. Um, if you've got a countable collection of finite sets, you can sort of go through them in a list. You could just list them all together. First you list all the elements in A1, then all the elements in A2, then all the elements in A3, etc. And then you have a list of all the elements of AN, and thus the union of the ANs is countable. All right. So now what we're going to do is we're going to let A be the set of discontinuities of F. So it's a set of points in the interval from A to B at which F is discontinuous. I suppose it doesn't make sense to define that at, because F can't possibly be discontinuous at the endpoints, but anyways. Um, so since F is defined and increasing on a b x is an a if and only if the limit from the right minus the limit from the left equals zero. Certainly if the limit from the right minus the limit from, no, great, equals zero, must be greater than zero. Certainly if this limit is greater than zero, then f is discontinuous there um, because the limits don't match up. And if you have a discontinuity, well, you can't have um, an asymptote there because x is defined, you can't have an asymptote in any particular point because f is defined everywhere. So the only type of uh, discontinuity you can have is one in which the limits from the left and the right are not equal. So f of x plus minus f of x minus is greater than zero. This holds if and only if there exists an n such that f of x plus minus f of x minus is greater than one over n. 
And that's true if and only if there exists an n such that x is in a n. So for any point x, x is in a if and only if there is some n such that x is in a n. So this means precisely that a is equal to the union of all the a n's. Thus, a is countable, because we already mentioned that the union of the a n's is a countable set. Okay, and finally, um, what we have is, well, you have the fact that countable sets have measure zero, but furthermore, if, if, you, if you don't want to use that fact, um, what you could do is you could say finite sets have measure zero so by theorem 3-4 so does A because what you can do is A is a, the union of the ANs and each AN is finite and so each AN has measure zero and so you've got a countable union of sets of measure zero and the resulting set will have measure zero. That's what theorem 3-4 says. Okay, so the set of discontinuities of F has measure zero, and so we're done. All right, and that finishes the proof. And like I alluded to earlier, this is actually very similar to the proof that of the fact that if you have an uncountable sum of strictly positive numbers, then the sum will be infinite. And this is something, of course, it's not true for countable sums because you could take this, say, the sum of um, 2 to the minus n from n equals 1 to infinity, that's going to converge to 2. Um, just like basic calculus sequences and series. Um, but, yeah, that's important because um, the proof actually isn't too difficult. Basically what you do is you look at, um, if you're taking an uncountable um, infinite sum, you look at you, a similar set, you look at all the points which evaluate to a value which is greater than um, 1 over n, and you say, well, if the sum of all these values were finite, then you could only have finitely many elements in this set. And you can categorize all of the points that you're summing over into these buckets based on if their size is greater than 1 over n. And then the fact, so, but you can only account for countably many elements in this way, and so, um, yeah, you, you, you run into a contradiction here. Um, and so that's how you prove that uncountable sum of strictly positive numbers is infinite, and it's, that's an important thing to know, um, particularly because I've, in my experience, it's one of those things that might not be taught to you in a class, but at some point you're expected to have learned it at some point. I sort of had this one going from um, real analysis from Baby Rudin to um, measure theory in Fallen's textbook. Um, my, yeah, my professors didn't really mention the this fact that an uncountable sum of positive numbers is positive didn't bring it up in um, the analysis class on baby rudin because it doesn't really come up at all. But then there are some places where it's useful and fallen and your teacher assumes, okay, you're taking a graduate level analysis class. You've probably seen this fact before. Um, and I'm sure it's not the case that, and I'm sure it's not the case that everyone who goes into a measure theory course has not seen that theorem before, but it's good to be aware of these things that don't necessarily fit into a course, but sort of come up sort of at random points um, throughout your educational career, and um, you're expected to have seen them in the past. Um, but yeah.
So, anyways, the interesting thing there is that that fact uses the same idea as this proof. And we finished this proof, and so we're done with this exercise.